Good morning. Today we move on in uh, the Believe series, and today we speak of the Bible. And so, as I've been saying for weeks now, this is kind of the foundational portion of what we're doing over this movement. And so these are important weeks to be here, so I'm glad you're here uh, to not only experience this, but to be challenged in how we think about the text and how we think about God. And so as we open our Bible, uh, I will tell you we're only going to be in one spot today. We're going to be in uh, Psalm 19. So if you have a Bible, you use an app on your phone, however you work that out, Psalm 19 is the only place you need to be. Um, And what we're going to be working through is uh, from our believe kind of curriculum is this key question. How do I know God and his will for my life? The idea that we're trying to get to, the idea that scripture lays out for us is I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God that guides my beliefs and my actions. And this verse that uh, we're memorizing in our group that I hope you're memorizing in your group is from 2 Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that's kind of this basis foundation for where we jump off into this psalm today. Uh, And where we're going is to kind of get a full idea of a God who speaks through multiple channels, a God who is authoritative, who is perfect, and who is actually searching us out through an active and living word. And It was Eugene Peterson who said, Christian spirituality is in its entirety rooted in and shaped by the scriptural text, which is to say this, think about where we would be as a spiritual body without this text. Everything that we have tumbles out of it, comes from it. And so as we look at it, we often dismiss it and look for something experiential to guide our faith, and yet all of our faith tumbles from the Bible. So let me start reading in Psalm 19 as we look into this idea that God speaks. And and I want to offer that God speaks and sometimes does so without a sound. Psalm 19, 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. And yet, verse 3, they have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes a circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. This is this beautiful poetry that David is laying out that that the Bible speaks, and yet God spoke before the spoken word. God speaks through nature. God speaks through the beauty of the skies and and the beauty of the night, the stars and a sunrise. God speaks without making a sound. God speaks uh, without using a word. This reminds me of art. Two of my favorite places in the world are in New York City, uh, the Guggenheim Museum and then uh, MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, are places I think, uh, for me, are very spiritual places. I can go there and lose a day and, and come out feeling refreshed and rejuvenated. And, and what I find in great art is great art speaks to uh, the person taking it in. You, you see the picture of somebody standing in front of art. I have one I pulled from, the, from MoMA. So you, you've seen these pictures. You've maybe done this before where you stand and stare at something and you, you attempt in a way to commune with the artist. I like this one because it is in MoMA, right? Modern art is kind of weird at times. And so white walls everywhere, and somebody's idea of art was to put a white canvas on a white wall. Like, literally, they did nothing but hang a canvas. And this person is sitting here staring at it going, what, what is the artist trying to say through this piece? And for 15, 20, 30 minutes, someone will sit here and go, what, what's being communicated? I've seen this piece, and I, I remember standing there going, I can't decide if this is lazy or genius. Because somebody decided, you know what, all of this art, what if my statement was nothing? What if my statement was, this is art, this is as much nothing as it's just as hard as something, and I actually got to the place staring at this myself where I said, you know what, I think this is more creative than doing something because this took some guts, and maybe he's tricked me into believing something and I'm just an idiot, and I, I've allowed for that in this. The second thing, uh, Guggenheim in 2006, we're coming through, and there's this installation uh, by a Chinese artist named uh, Kai Guo Cheng, and he had this incredible installation, and the Guggenheim is a work of art in and of itself. It was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, and if you've ever seen it, it has this kind of rotating, this just giant um, 
a walkway. It's this elevated one after another. So there's this huge rotunda in the center, eight stories tall. And so there's this big open space. And then the art is viewed by just walking slowly up a circular ramp that takes you to the top. And, and what he had in the moment was he had this incredible thing. And you can see kind of on the left side of the picture, there are these bursts of light. The first thing he had done, he had this whole installation where there was a, a car bomb, basically, in art. And so we had a Chevy Cavalier on the top floor of the museum and bursts of light coming from it. And then suspended over eight stories were various forms of the, another car and another car, whole cars with these bursts of light coming out of them. And it was as if he stopped time and you got this picture of something happening. I'm like, what is he trying to say through this? And as we're walking up uh, these levels, we run into these wolves and there's 99 life-size wolves they're all uh, intricately made. You're walking in between them as you figure out where you're going. And eventually they all kind of sort of cycle up there and they run into a, a glass wall. And then they're fallen and, and broken at the end. And that, I, I was like stunned by this. And he was making some statement about a herd mentality. He was making a statement about uh, everybody going the same way. And, and I found myself going, well, a herd mentality is sheep. But he's using wolves. Is he trying to say, maybe he's not exonerating us. And maybe if we're in the herd, we're just as guilty as the leader. Maybe. And, and I find myself just, my mind is, is tingling by this artist. He's saying incredible things. He's not there. And yet he's speaking through art. And what we see in nature is very much the same thing. God speaks without making a sound. God speaks uh, through his art. And his art is his creation. And so if we see mountains as just rocks, then we're, we're missing it. What are mountains? What is God saying through the mountains? If the sun is just a, a big ball of gaseous combustion, right, you break it down to what is it? It's just a white canvas on the wall. Well, if it's just gaseous combustion, then what's the sun? And yet, if it's creation and it's a statement and it's saying something, and like the psalmist saying, nothing is deprived of its warmth. If there's something behind it, then it's beautiful and it speaks to you. Everything in nature cries out that there is no accident here. I think God begins to start a conversation with us through nature. We're not an accident. Like great music or great art, it's created with a purpose and a passion. There's something being said. And what we have to find out is what is God saying through nature? Nature moves us. The Grand Canyon, a, a great sunset. You can think of a time in your life where you've been, wow kind of stunned by something you've just seen in nature. It cries out to you, there is more to this place. There is beauty and there is meaning and there is life. People are valuable. The world is valuable. Life here means something and it leads to something. Nature speaks to us. Nature is God's grace to all. And yet, if we're honest, it's still kind of a foggy glass to look through. And so the psalm continues. It doesn't stop at verse 6. It continues on. Because nonverbal communication is good, but it's, it's insufficient. It's good, but it's insufficient. It's so, so like, um, you know, I don't know much about this, but like a preacher can tell when you're done. You know this? A preacher can read the room and see when people have checked out. And so when the message goes into minute 46, you know, and you're, you're kind of, everybody's, Looking at your watch, you know, some of you wear a giant watch. That would help me. You just kind of hold it up and tap it. Uh, but we know. We see distraction. The preacher can see. And body language, nonverbal communication, I can read that. I know, oh, we've gone long. Um, somebody wants to do something else, and it's not this. And so we should probably wrap this up. I can tell a lot from that. Stirring, yawning, all those things, checking the phone. Um, just talking on the phone. That's happened before where someone's like, I'm done. And they just had a conversation in the congregation. That didn't go well. But I can't know everything through your nonverbal communication, can I? I? I can't know if you have a brisket that needs to be tended to and you really need to get out of it. You can't tell me that sitting there. You can try, you know, brisket. <laughs> I won't know. Nonverbal communication has its limits. And so the scripture continues. Verse 7, the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. 
They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. In verse 14, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We start with this idea that maybe nature's enough. Like maybe everybody can just get it. Nonverbal communication. God speaks without saying a word. And then the scriptures go, goes on to say, but the law of the Lord is perfect. It adds on to, God not only communicates non-verbally, but then there's this verbal communication that happens. And when you're in the Old Testament, when we're talking about the law, that's the books leading up to the New Testament. The law is the Old Testament. And so when it says the law, you should read the scripture. The scripture is perfect. It refreshes the soul. It's trustworthy. It's right. In verse 8, this word right, the precepts of the Lord are right. We think of that word pretty simply. It's either right or it's wrong. Okay, whatever. Simple word, but the emphasis in the original language for this word right, it's like a straight edge, like a ruler, in the sense that that word right, it doesn't just mean it isn't wrong, it means it's the standard by which everything else is measured. It is the standard by which everything else is measured. C.S. Lewis looks at this language and he famously said that it isn't the language of a man who is appreciating law and order, but of a man ravished by beauty. How many of us are ravished by beauty in the book? Most of us can appreciate bits and pieces, and we can appreciate the, the, the wisdom and a little bit of the law. We can appreciate in the New Testament where it says we're saved. We appreciate that. But C.S. Lewis reads this psalm, and he says, this is not a man appreciating law and order. This is a man ravished by beauty. It gives joy to the heart. gives light to the eyes. is radiant. It's like a man describing ravishing beauty. He sees no restrictions in this. He sees only freedom. And see, we we often look at the law and we think, gosh, but I mean, it's so restrictive. And I think in order to see it and find it beautiful, you have to see it as something other than than a set of restrictions and boundaries and do this and don't do that. I I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can look at restriction and we can look at uh, wisdom and law and we can actually see freedom in that. You can learn this, if you would like this week, by visiting your local HEB and just go down the cereal aisle. We go to the HEB Plus at Bandera in 1604. Anybody else go to this HEB? It's a little bit insane. The cereal aisle is twice as wide as all the other aisles, I think because people's heads just start, you know, like leaking out of their ears because it's just insane. There have to be at least 200 different varieties of cereal. Ask a six-year-old to take a second and go pick a cereal. You're there. I mean, you might as well buy a tent from one of the other. You know, they got everything there. So you just buy a tent and you can camp there because she'll never figure it out. There's too many choices. And so in order to love my child and restrict my child, I say, hey, see these here? None with characters. You know, there's no bunnies or, or marshmallows. You know, see these? These are actually what's good for you. And I think you'll like them. So why don't you pick one of these four? Well, then we're out in, you know, 20 seconds. Oh, well, this one looks good. Let's go. And so if we see the law as restriction designed to like dampen our joy, then we've missed the point. If we see it as God saying, look, you have a whole lot of options in this world, and a lot of them are really not good for you. So let me narrow your focus on that which is good for you and let you choose from that. And what that is, is not restriction. That's the greatest freedom in the world. To be able to say, all of these things that are available to me, a lot of those are going to hurt me. A lot of those are destructive. A lot of those are not good for my soul. And so God does us the favor of saying, let me give you some places that you can go. Let me give you some guidelines to which you can live. And it's beautiful. It revives and refreshes the soul, it says in verse 7. Refreshes the soul. Derek Kinder, a commentator, said that the soul word in Hebrew is, it's actually like the nuance of that is it's your psyche. It's yourself. And so what he would say, the scripture is saying, is the scripture has the power to show you who you are. That the scripture has a power to show you who you are and actually restore your true identity. That by looking at this, if it's right and it is the standard of measure, that by looking at the Bible and reading the Bible and internalizing the Bible, you and I can actually get a better sense of who we are and who we were created to be. That's something. That's not just a book of rules, of do's and don'ts. That's a mirror that gives us a true sense of who God created us to be. 
Verse 12 and 13 have this idea in them as well. Help me be who I was created to be. Who can discern their own errors? Well, not me. I'm the last one to know. Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Scripture can be a mirror to our souls. Who can know their own errors? I don't know. I don't know until I know. And what this is saying is wisdom can't be fast-tracked. Wisdom can't be fast-tracked. Anybody uh, besides me look back every five or ten years and think what an idiot I used to be? Every five or ten years you look back and go, man, I was stupid. I thought I knew everything. I had it figured out. I was dumb. And and my experience to this point tells me that every five or ten years I'm going to look back and I'm going to think. And so I know when I turn 40, I'm going to look back at 35 and go, thought you had some things figured out, idiot. And when I'm 50, I'm going to look back and go, oh. 40, I really thought I had it at that point. In every five or ten years, I find myself doing this. And yet, everywhere we are in those moments, we think we kind of got it figured out. Hey, I think I, I feel that way right now. I feel like I think I have some things finally figured out. And I know for a fact in 15 years, I'm going to look back and think, man, I didn't know anything. I mean, think about when, if you were 20, being five. Well, five-year-olds think they know everything. Right? They get into kindergarten and they learn their ABCs and they're like, this is easy. I got this, Dad. And when they're 20, they're going to look back and be like, I was stupid. I didn't know anything. And we're looking at them when they're 20 like, oh, gosh, you have no idea. And you're, if you're in here and you're 50, then you look at me like it's stupid. And then someone who's 65 looks at you that way. It's just how it works. Wisdom isn't fast trackable. How do you get wisdom? Man, you earn it in life slowly you learn it and you earn it somebody can tell you all the things you need to know about children you can read all the books there are to read about raising children until you have children you don't know about children you know you can learn it but you got to earn it is what really comes down to and wisdom works this way the beauty of scripture is it can save us a lot of the misery when I was 20 I was stupid I was a total fool I didn't know I was a total fool and had I been rooted in this it would have saved a whole lot of destruction in my life. In the life of those who I encountered and I interacted with, they might have been saved from a ton of misery and destruction had I only rooted my life to this wisdom. Because this wisdom is available to us from day one. And while I can't fast track my learning process in this world, I can come here and I can be saved from a ton of misery if I live my life according to the way that the book would lay out. This is what C.S. Lewis is talking about, the beauty of the text, the beauty of the Bible. Is it something that, man, it takes a whole life to learn some of the things that are captured here. And if this can give me a rail to build my life upon, if this can give me a guideline to avoid destruction and misery, that's a beautiful thing. You know what a life vest is? At its core, you know what it is? It's foam and fabric, right? Think about it. What is a life vest? It's foam and fabric. That's all it is. It's foam and fabric right up until the point where it's used to save a life, and then it's something entirely different, isn't it? It's foam and fabric when it's under the seat of the boat. It's foam and fabric when it's hanging on a hook. It's foam and fabric in my garage right now, but on a child saving a life, a life vest is something totally different. It's no longer foam and fabric. It is a tool of salvation. And we get really used to seeing ink on a page. It's just ink on a page. It's ink on a page. It's ancient words. It's ancient wisdom. It's just ink on a page. And until we see it as the very tool of salvation, we don't see the fullness of what Scripture is designed to be. It's not foam and fabric. It's a tool of salvation. It's not ink on a page. It's a tool of salvation. We hear a lot of things, really silly things about what the Bible is. People say, oh, the Bible is it's like a great textbook. It's not a textbook. It's not designed for your learning. People say it's a guidebook for life. It's not a guidebook. It's not here to give you instructions. People say, oh, it's like a map book to get you through life. It's not a map book. It's not here to give you directions. It is the book, and it is here to give you life. And if we see less than that, then we are shortchanging what God created this to be for us. It is a gift for us. It's not a map book, a guidebook, a textbook. It's the book, and in it has the secret to what our life is supposed to be about. Scripture has a purpose. It searches us. It warns us. You hear this in the the latter half of this psalm. It searches us. Search me and know me, God. It's an active and a living word. It searches us. 
Your precepts give me joy. Your commands give me radiance and light. And the psalmist says, may the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. This word pleasing, when you see that in the Old Testament, as you read through this, as we go through believe and you continue to run across pleasing in these Old Testament uh, scriptures, pleasing in the Old Testament is almost always a reference to sacrifice. It's almost always a reference to sacrifice. May the sacrifice be pleasing to you. And so when you see pleasing in the Old Testament, you don't have to look real hard. You're going to see it's a sacrifice. And so what the psalmist is, is pointing out is his words, his life, his heart. It's a sacrificial way of giving back to the Lord. May, may my life as a living sacrifice, this is where Paul picks it up in Romans. May this living sacrifice be pleasing to you. This is beautiful. May my sacrifice of my life be pleasing to you. It's beautiful, and yet it's the psalms and trouble looms. Verse 11 says, in keeping the, these precepts and keeping these commands, there's great reward. There's an implication there. There's an unspoken. If you keep them and there's a great reward, something else is true. If you fail to keep them, there's punishment. In violating them, there's, there's consequence. To be made right then requires a sacrifice. Our sacrifice, as pleasing as it could be, is not enough. Which is where Jesus comes in, right? It's remarkable that, that the reward for Jesus' perfect law-keeping, which is what Jesus came and lived a sinless life, the reward for his life comes to us, and the punishment for our imperfect law-keeping goes to him. Seems fair? Christianity, as seen in the scripture, says this, I delight because obeying God's law delights the one who delighted me so much that he died for me. People say, well, why, why would I, if I got grace, why would I... Why do I need this? I got grace. I'm free. I can do what I want. I delight in the obedience of God's law because it delights the one who loved me so much that he would die for me. I love that. That's the beauty that C.S. Lewis talks about. That's the beauty of seeing this not as a burden but as a blessing. If the Bible is essentially rules, if it's essentially a rule book or a moral path to goodness, we're hosed. If this is a guidebook and a map book and it's a textbook and it's, it's some God's little instruction book for life, good luck. We're, we're all in trouble. If this is uh, the way, the moral path to goodness, none of us can fulfill it. And so the Bible can't be that. If it's all pointing to Jesus, it's something else entirely. If it's all pointing to Jesus, then we have a whole different concept of what the Bible is. In Luke 24, 44, Jesus basically says this. Jesus says, all of Scripture is about me. All of the law is about me. What Jesus says is take a big arrow from every single page of your Bible and point it to Jesus. He is in every single page. And it all points to him as the rescue. It all points to him as the redeemer. It all points to him as the necessary sacrifice for the thing we couldn't do. And so the Bible is essentially the story of Jesus. And so when it's in Noah, it's about Jesus. And when it's about Jonah, it's about Jesus. Tim Keller famously laid all of this out. We'll walk through it. Jesus is the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden, whose obedience is imputed to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel, who though innocently slain, has blood that now cries out for our acquittal and not our condemnation. Jesus is the true and better Abraham, who answered the call of God to leave all that was comfortable and familiar and go into the void, not knowing that he would create a new people for God. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered by his father, but sacrificed by his father on the mount. And when God said to Abraham, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your child who you loved, we can look at God and say, now we know you love us because you did not withhold your only begotten son who you loved. Jesus is the true and better Joseph, who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed him and sold him and uses his power to save him. Jesus is the true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for and saves his stupid friends. Jesus is the true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. Jesus is the true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly life, didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, Jesus left his life, lost his life so that we might live. Jesus is the true and better Jonah who was cast into the storm and the deep so we could be brought in. Jesus is the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true temple. Jesus is the true sacrifice, true lamb, true light, and true bread. This is about Jesus. The Bible is not about you. The Bible is not about you and what you need to do. The Bible is about Jesus and what he has done for us. And ultimately what this is is more than a guidebook. This is about love and life and hope and redemption. This is about the oxygen of our very breath. And 
in this, loving this, seeing ravishing beauty in this, finding hope in this. It's foundational to us understanding who we are and what God's will for us might be. This is the character of God laid out on a page. This is the hope of heaven as a gift to us. If we see it as less, we miss the point, but if we see it for what it's intended to be, then we can look skyward. We can look to the heavens and we can say, great are you, Lord, because you've given us everything we need and you've given us a way to live and a way to breathe and our lives are then not about us. Our lives are about being poured out that our very breath might be used to praise the one who loved us so much to drag us from the pit to rescue and redeem us and this is what we were created for and that is what is here. And so my hope today and my prayer is that we would see the Bible as more than a book, that we would see it as the source of light and of love and of hope. And as we live from it and we live by it, that we would live for something greater than ourselves.